Part 2 Chapter 17 Death Mountain loomed large and imposing over Link, as he gazed at it from his perch atop the Laneru Tower. The volcano stood tall in the middle of a red, craggy landmass. The green of Zora's domain and Hyrule Field faded, giving way to the red dirt and rock. The path from what he could see led into a series of switchbacks that winded their way up the mountainous terrain until, finally, reaching the base of the volcano. He could see the Divine Beast. Varu Danya. He hadn't seen it before but that's because his visibility had been hindered by the rain that had hovered over Zora's domain. He could see it now, though. A massive lizard-like construction that walked on the steeply sloped surface of Death Mountain as if it were nothing more than a gentle hill. It seemed unperturbed by the jagged lines of magma that flowed down from the open maw of the volcano. As Link watched, the distant divine beast paused, lifted at its head, and opened its mechanical mouth in a silent roar. He frowned. Ruda had controlled the weather over Zora's domain, and had just recently started acting out. Was that a coincidence, or was there something more sinister happening? Was Rudanya acting out in a similar manner? And if so, what power did it have over the land? Link sighed and reached down into the small package sitting on the floor of the Sheikah Tower next to him. He carefully unwrapped it, revealing dried strips of lamb and a few carrots. He'd picked this handy meal up at Kokoriko Village several days prior, before riding out of Zoro's domain. He wondered if he should make any more trips to Kokoriko or Hateno, now that he had unlocked the tower in this region, enabling quick travel between the two. He could not think of anything that he either did not already have, or did not want to have to carry, however, and it was still too early in the day to warrant traveling back to sleep in his new house. A house purchased, of course, through the loan of rupees by a very old Sheikah and a young girl's body. While he ate a carrot with one hand, he used the other to navigate through the menus of the Sheikah Slate, activating the telescope rune. He lifted the Sheikah Slate one-handed up and peered through its translucent screen at the path winding up towards Death Mountain. After a few moments, he found what he was looking for. A small settlement at the base of the foothills, right before the path transformed into the switchbacks. It was here that most of the trading to and from Death Mountain was done, from what Lincoln had been told. Gorons would transport valuable ore and gems down the mountain and trade for fire-resistant cloth, spices, or other materials not found on or around Death Mountain. Or, at least, that is how it once was, before the Calamity. Now, however, no one that Link had talked to really knew what he would find. From this distance, Link could not see any movement within the settlement. He knew that some trade still happened, so he presumed that someone still occupied the settlement, how many people, however, was another question entirely. He set the Sheikah slate down and finished off the small meal he'd packed himself. Standing, he gathered up his supplies, taking one last look around the tower. His eyes fell on Hyrule Castle. For the briefest of moments, he saw a flash of memory in his mind. A beautiful castle against a clear blue sky. And then it disappeared. That had been happening more often lately, except for the one location that Link hoped it would his home. He bought the house in Hatano Village, preventing it from being torn down because he had found out that it once belonged to his family before the Calamity. He'd hoped that being in it would spark some memory of his father or mother, or his experiences growing up, but those memories remained firmly locked behind the barrier in his mind, put in place by the Shrine of Resurrection. Link shook off the thoughts and took a deep breath, stepping up to the edge of the tower. Far below across the Zora River, he could see Spirit. The horse had, as he always did, remained close to where he'd been left, drinking water from the river and munching on tufts of grass. Link unfolded the paraglider and held it above his head. He still had to push down flutters of anxiety at the prospect of leaping off such a high location. That anxiety fled when he stepped off the tower, however, and the wind caught his paraglider. He could fly. At least, that's how it felt to him as he floated over the river below. Air rushed through his hair, blowing his loose sideburns, 
and causing his blue champion tunic to flutter lightly. He crossed the river with ease and banked his glider gently, sending him into a lazy spiral. From his vantage, he felt as though he could see everything. A rabbit hopping across the dirt road froze in fear when Link's shadow had passed overhead. A fox curiously nosed around in the grass, looking for food. He even caught sight of a majestic buck with a many-pointed set of antlers, standing sentinel in a tree-lined meadow. Grinning, Link circled back around into the wind. He could see fish swimming in the river. Suddenly, a gray blur shot down past him, straight into the water below. A moment later, a gray and white bird burst out of the water, flapping its wide wings. It lifted out of the water, carrying a large green fish in its talons. Amazed, he watched as the bird laboriously gained altitude, while simultaneously fighting to control the wildly writhing fish. It gave him ideas on how he could use the paraglider in an ambush. Finally, he glided down, landing with a small stumble on the road, just a few feet from where Spirit lazily ate grass. As he touched down, his horse looked up, meaning his eyes, and snorted. Spirit returned to his grass. Link smiled, folding up the paraglider and walking over to strap it in place on Spirit's saddle. He would have to figure out what he would carry and leave behind when he finally made the trek up Death Mountain. He wouldn't be able to take Spirit up into the extreme heat of the volcano. He would have enough trouble carrying enough water for himself, much less to try and find a way to keep the horse fed and watered. He looked up towards the volcano. A pillar of gray smoke rose from it, mingling with the patchy clouds overhead. How strange it must be to live in such a volatile place. I mean their homes, not to mention their lives, are always at risk. An unexpected lava flow, earthquakes, and even the occasional full eruption. Any of these could happen at any time. Link looked over at the speaker. Princess Zelda was dressed in her normal blue travel attire, though the sleeves of the white undershirt had been rolled up to her elbows. Still, the heat of the summer sun beat down on them, leaving a light sheen of sweat on her brow. They had both hoped that they would escape some of this heat upon leaving the Gerudo Desert, and they had for a time. However, spring gave way to an abnormally hot summer. Somehow, Link thought that they could have planned their visit to Daruk and Rudania a little better. Still, once the princess got her mind set on something, there was really no changing it. She was as stubborn as a Gerudo, or perhaps a Goron. He kept the comparison to himself. He did not think she would appreciate it very much. We will have to leave the horses soon, too, won't we? She asked, reaching up and placing a hand upon her white stallion's neck. They hadn't been getting along very well lately. Link thought that the royal horse, which matched the pride and stubbornness of his master well, might have been offended at being left at the stable outside of the desert instead of being allowed to continue traveling with them. Unfortunately, the situation was much like the situation here. It was too hot, and there was too little water to risk the horses. He would have to try and give her some advice on how to ease the horse's wounded pride. That was, if he could figure out how to do so without wounding hers in the process. Well, her voice had grown sharper, drawing his attention back to her. She raised her eyebrows, irritated green eyes clearly demanding an answer. Link opened his mouth to do so. And she was gone. Link slowly closed his mouth as the memory faded. It happened so suddenly that in a way, it didn't even feel like a memory to him. It could have just happened. She could have been standing right there. She had been standing right there. 100 years ago. Link opened his eyes again, inhaling the sweet sense of spring. How much longer will spring continue? He wondered. He'd awoken several weeks prior, and truth be told, he had no idea how late into the season it was. Based on the activity in the fields around Hatino Village in Kakariko, however, he assumed that they were still in the midst of planting season, so it would be some time before the summer heat overtook him. Perhaps Death Mountain would be more bearable when he visited this time. Smiling faintly, Link lifted a foot into Spirit's stirrup and hefted himself up onto the horse's back. Patting Spirit's neck gently, he clicked his tongue and nudged the horse's side with his knee. They began to move at a gentle trot, turning up the path that led towards Death Mountain. The path took Link northeast for a time, up a hill lined with pine trees. To the right side of the road rose the steep cliff sides of the ridges and plateaus surrounding Zora's domain. From this side, 
while further north, the land dropped off into a large valley labeled Triboli Valley on the Sheikah Slate. The hill seemed to mark the border between the more lush and verdant areas of Hyrule Field and Zora's Domain, while the earth in the valley grew redder and the grass sparser. As he rode Spirit, he began to notice other signs of habitation. There were noticeable tracks on the road, left by boots, hooves, and cartwheels. While the ground was now dry, it had only recently been thick mud as a result of the rains from Zora's Domain, leaving many of the tracks deeply set in the packed dirt. He did see the other tracks too, tracks that he thought might belong to the Zolthos, Bokoblins, or the larger Moblins, but these were rarer and further spread out. Seeing the signs of life bolstered Link's mood as he climbed the hill. Though he didn't see anyone else on the road, the fact that others did still travel it meant much to him. What would it be like if he successfully defeated Ganon? Would the Kingdom of Hyrule rise again, or would another nation rise in its place? What would come of the Zora, the Rito, and the Hylians? Cass and Sedan both had lamented the fact that their races were so insulated from each other. Would that change after Ganon was defeated? Could it change before then? Could I do something to change it? Link thought, as he looked up at the cliffs to his south. Azora seemed more amiable to outsiders now, were the Gorons as unwelcoming as the Zora had been. Link pulled out his Sheikah slate, gazing down at the smooth black surface of its screen. He opened up the image gallery and began to slowly scroll through the dozens of photographs that Princess Zelda had left on it. As they flipped through images of flowers and fauna, of landmarks, and the people that she obviously cared for, Link was struck by a sense of wonder at the level of insight this simple device gave him into her character. He still knew so little about her, yet he thought that he could guess at her personality from this. He thought that she must have been a patient person, warm to the people around her. He thought to his brief memory of her earlier in the day. She was intelligent and studious. She loved the land and the people within it. He thought of her as stubborn, but why wouldn't she be? She was a princess, after all. But more than that, it seemed to him that, in that brief memory, she had spoken to him simply, and with no airs of royalty. It made him think of the way Sedan interacted with his entourage. Had Princess Zelda been as relaxed around Link as Sedan was with his guards? He landed on the image of the princess dressed in her white gown and standing before the pool of water. Her expression seemed sad, but she still smiled. What was she thinking in this moment? Was she hopeful for a future without Ganon? Was she fearful for the eventual confrontation? What did she see when she saw Link? Did she see a hero? A guardian? A friend? He wondered if she could see him now. The morning gave way to the mid-afternoon by the time Link reached the fork in the road. He still hadn't seen anyone on the road as he traveled, but that was no longer surprising to him, after all of the travel he'd done since waking. After consulting his map for a time longer, Link turned Spirit to the right, away from Death Mountain, and towards the Akala Highlands. Pur had not had any ability to fix his guardian sword when he brought it to her. Well, he supposed she very well may have been able to fix it, which she flat out refused, stating that her research was in ancient Sheikah technology and guardians, not weapons and armor. Then she told him to go see Robbie if he wanted to get his sword fixed. It's like they're not in any hurry for me to save the world, Link thought with a wry smile. But the detour would only take about a week, by his estimation on the map. He was worried about his ability to harm the creations of Ganon without one of the strange energy weapons, though. It would not be good to go into the fight unprepared, assuming a similar creature occupied Rudania. Shortly after the fork, the road transitioned from dirt to one of old brick. Many of the bricks had long since been overgrown with grass or covered with dirt, but he could still see many of the gray bricks underneath the overgrowth. Spirit's hooves clip-clopped loudly enough to echo off the sheer cliff face to Link's right. As they continued up the hill, Link saw a lake spread out below him, and in the distance, the trading post in the foothills of Death Mountain. With sudden and abrupt certainty, Link knew that he'd traveled this road before. While he saw no flash of memory to accompany this feeling, he knew that he had walked this road alongside Princess Zelda. He could almost see her on her white horse, riding alongside him. Perhaps she would be taking photographs with the Sheikah Slate. 
Out of curiosity, he pulled his Sheikah slate out again, checking for any photographs from this location, though finding none. Still satisfied with the tense of rightness that he felt, he continued on, his head held high. That evening, he made camp just past another fork in the road, in the midst of some old ruins that he thought might have once been some kind of watchpost. He found a few rusted shields and broken spears that told him as such. As he looked around for wood for a fire, he found other signs of life in the area. The faded and tattered remains of a flag mostly buried under the rubble, the remains of an old bed, and a broken cylindrical telescope. More worrisome, he found indication of other more recent inhabitants as well. Old cook fires, picked apart animal skeletons, and a roughly carved wooden club. Clearly bow goblins had made camp here before, as well. The thought of it made Link's skin crawl, and he proceeded to do another loop around his small camp, crouching low and looking for any fresher signs of the monsters. Though he found nothing recent, there were plenty of indications they had used it in the past. Tonight, however, Link was alone. He did find out what happened to the watchpost, though. As he rummaged around for any fresher signs of bow goblins, he came across the broken leg of a guardian. Just a single leg, but it told him what he needed to know. Why this place had been reduced to little more than rubble, and the old remains of its foundation. Perhaps the soldiers here had put up a fight, even managed to take a guardian's leg off, but it hadn't been enough to stop their wave of destruction. This wasn't like the Temple of Time, or even Fort Hatano. No guardian corpses littered the ground here. It hurt Link to think of those forgotten soldiers, fighting, perhaps to save their home, as he had done all those years ago. They had likely fallen, just as he had. Link returned to his camp, carrying what broken pieces of wood he could find among the ruins. He cooked the last of the salted fish that the Zora had given him on his cookpot, adding a few spices and herbs that he had picked up in Hatino village. The meal turned out well, though he thought that he could do better with the mixture of spices. Either way, other than some of the travel rations he had packed from Hatano village, he would need to start hunting for meat again tomorrow, if he wanted to have anything beyond jerky and mushrooms. It took him some time to fall asleep that night, mind plagued with thoughts of scared soldiers desperately trying to fend off advancing guardians. It was far enough away from the castle that they might not even have known that the castle had fallen. They had probably wondered where their princess and champion with the legendary sword was. Can I see it? The soldier was not so much younger than Link himself. He was slightly shorter than Link, with freckles and a mop of red hair. He had left his spear resting against the wall of the barracks in his haste to meet the man who wielded the Sword of Legend. In truth, Link would rather not pull the Master Sword out to show every young boy and girl that dreamt of someday being a hero of Hyrule, but it seemed wrong of him to refuse the boy's request. After all, how long had it been that he had been just like this boy? He hadn't been a soldier, rather. He had been a squire in service to a knight. But he dreamed of being a hero all the same. Oh, how he sometimes wished he could have gone back and slapped his younger self. Link reached over his shoulder, pulling the Master Sword out of its scabbard. As always, it slid free with ease, as if it were eager to be out of its confines. The young man's eyes widened as he took in the brilliant blade and its purple hilt. It was a magnificent weapon, unblemished and always sharp. It was perfectly balanced, just the right weight, and the exact length that he needed. It was unfortunate, then, that carrying it provided to be such a burden. Would you like to hold it? Link asked, his voice quiet. The young man looked up at Link in surprise, and after a moment of hesitation, shook his head. Oh, no, Sir Link. I couldn't. I didn't think that the sword would find me worthy. And I've heard the legends of what happens when the Master Sword does not find someone worthy. Myths. So far, in all of Link's short time wielding the Master Sword, he had yet to see it sap the life out of someone who touched it. Still, though, he would not push the matter. Nodding, he returned the Master Sword to its scabbard. The soldier's eyes followed it hungrily. He looked like he wanted to ask more questions, but then appeared to decide otherwise, thanking Link and retrieving his spear. Link sighed softly and walked over to stand in the open doorway at the southern Akala guard post. Outside, lightning flashed and torrential rain poured. He and Princess Zelda had been in Goron City for the last week, helping Daruk master his control over the Divine Beast. Two days before they departed, 
a man had arrived, bearing a message for the princess, informing her of a new discovery that the doctors Pur and Rabi had made in the Akala Highlands. Her original plan had been to visit Mifa in Zora's domain to get an update on her control over Ruta, but that, it would seem, could wait. It had been Link's hope to reach the Citadel and rest there for the night, as it was far more defensible than this small watchpost. But at least Princess Zelda had agreed to take the guard captain's quarters for the night. He had spoken with the captain, and the old soldier had readily agreed to post guards outside of her door. Link would take up that post later in the night, when he knew an attack would be most likely. She would likely be irritated to see him standing guard when she woke in the morning. She never liked when he posted guards outside the door, after all. Still, he was her appointed knight and would not shirk his duties, even when in a supposedly safe location. If she disliked it, then she would have to take that up with her father. He couldn't help but to smile slightly at the thought, knowing full well that she had already done so, repeatedly. Sir Link, the new voice behind him made Link sigh softly before turning around to find another soldier, this one older than Link by at least two decades, looking hopefully towards the hilt sticking up from behind Link's shoulder. Would you be willing to allow me the chance to glimpse your sword? The next morning brought Link the chance to see what he had been unable to see in the deep of the night before. North of the ruins that he had slept in across the bridge that led into the Akala region stood a castle. At first, it looked as though the castle was impossibly tall, easily dozens of stories in height. However, upon further inspection, he determined that, no, it had just been built upon a mountain, which accounted for most of its height. Finally, as he pulled out his Sheikah slate to inspect it closer, he realized with shock that it was not built on a mountain, but into it. Stone walls and structures had been erected all around the mountain, at its base, on its sides, and at its peak. And at the center of the castle stood a glowing Sheikah tower. Eyes wide, Link lowered the Sheikah slate, clipping it to his belt. His map named this structure, though it gave no indication to its significance or its magnificence. The Akala Citadel. He felt almost giddy at seeing it. He wondered if the structure held people. Why wouldn't the refugees of 100 years ago have settled in a castle like that? While he was still too far to make out clear details, the idea of finding another stronghold of Hylian kind excited him. He quickly gathered his equipment and saddled spirit, riding north across a bridge that spanned a deep canyon. It took him more than an hour before the road he followed wound past the ruins of an old town that sat at the base of the citadel. The mountain that the citadel sat on sprang up from the bottom of a large canyon, and the only way to reach it was by crossing a bridge over the canyon. This small town sat on the side of the bridge opposite the citadel, a home for families of soldiers and a marketplace for those soldiers to enjoy while not on duty. At least that is what the old town of Kasudo had likely been 100 years prior. Now as Link turned off the road that led past the town and rode through the shattered gate that had once protected the town, he found it to be a lifeless husk. It was much like the other ruins he had found on his journey. Many of the buildings had been destroyed beyond recognition, while those that still had standing walls were still in no condition to be lived in. But what of the citadel? Had it stood in the face of the Guardian attack? Link's earlier hopes had begun to fade as he saw the state that Kasuda had been left in, but they were dashed as he stopped at the foot of the bridge that led across to the Akala Citadel. The bridge that crossed the canyon had long ago collapsed, leaving Link with no way of inspecting the citadel in person. From what he could see from here, however, he told him all he needed to know. Like the Temple of Time with its side that made it look whole, the citadel also looked unblemished from one side, while the other revealed the destruction that it had suffered. Dead guardians were visible all over the citadel. Some of them lay in heaps at the bottom of the canyon, while others had been frozen in their ascent up the mountain, spider-like legs still somehow clinging to the rock after 100 years. Those that had gotten into the fortress, however, had clearly done the damage they needed to. He could see guardian corpses in the middle of the destroyed walls, having breached the defenses of the fortress before finally being defeated. That alone would not have meant the citadel was lost, of course, but the presence of the substance that Impa called Malice likely did. He could see the strange purple substance, the same from within the Divine Beast, oozing out from within the citadel, sliding down walls and covering floors. He doubted that any Hylian would be able to cohabit a place with the substance. 
With a sigh, Link prepared to turn back and continue on his way when movement from the Citadel stopped him. He looked back and frowned as he saw something, hovering in the air near the Sheikah Tower. It was difficult to make out from this distance, so he pulled out the Sheikah Slate and used the telescope mode to get a better picture of what the thing was. It was some kind of construct made of black metal that hovered via a trio of spinning blades that chopped the air. A single blue eye at the end of a long cylinder hanging down from its inverted body, swiveling around and looking at its surroundings. The flying thing's advanced construction, and the designs on its body, meant that it was unmistakably ancient Sheikah in design, and it glowed with the red light that had invested Ruta. It was a guardian. Different, yes, from the many-legged guardians that Link had seen thus far, but its design was clear. Furthermore, it was still functioning. Fear gripped Link's heart as he watched the Guardian hover around the ruins of the Citadel, guarding it from anyone seeking to reclaim the fortress or, perhaps, still seeking for any remaining life within it. After seeing the Guardian on the Great Plateau and Fort Hateno, he had assumed that they were all broken down, if not defeated. But here was proof that at least one still survived and remained under Ganon's influence. Link turned spirit gripping the reins in a white-knuckled grip. He felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end as he turned his back on one of the things that had killed him a hundred years prior. Could it see him from so far away? Would it follow, if it did? Link kicked his horse into a gallop, leaning over the horse's neck and urging as much speed out of him as he could. He sped through the old town, expecting that in any moment he would feel searing heat on his back. As Spirit burst out from Kasuto's gate, Link finally looked back. Nothing followed. The Guardian had not seen him. He pulled his horse to a stop and dismounted, leaning over with his hands on his knees. He shook violently and closed his eyes, trying to force down the sudden wave of nausea that threatened to overtake him. It was too much. Fumbling with his Sheikah slate, he navigated it to the map. His finger hovered over the icon that would teleport him back to Hateno Village, back to the house he called his own. But what would that accomplish? Eventually, Pura would find out he was there, and come demanding to know what he was doing. Zora's domain, then? No. The eyes of the Zor elders would only grow accusing once more. Finally, he settled on the Great Plateau. The tower. He could teleport there, away from everyone else. No one could reach him there. The Sheikah Slade shook in his hands. Finally, with a groan, he clipped it back to his belt. Link sat in the red dirt of the Akala Highlands breathing deeply and trying to calm his nerves. It wasn't coming after him. It wouldn't attack him. It wouldn't kill him. He closed his eyes tightly, trying to force the image of the Flying Guardian from his mind. Why couldn't he forget it, like he'd forgotten everything else? Link felt something warm press against the back of his head. A second later, he felt a blast of hot air against his neck, as spirit snorted. Link exhaled slowly, reaching back and patting the horse's warm nose. He opened his eyes again and stood, brushing the dirt off of his pants. He turned, running his hands along Spirit's nose. Thanks, boy. After fishing out an apple from his pack and giving it to the horse, he remounted and rejoined the road, leaving the fallen citadel behind. That evening, Link made camp in a small cleft at the base of a long ridge. Shortly after passing the citadel, the land began to slope down into a deep valley between the ridge and a series of steep hills and saddles. He would have been fine making camp under one of the trees, but a light drizzling rain began shortly before sunset, coupled with plummeting temperatures. It had not been difficult to find a small alcove that provided shelter from the rain and gave him the chance to build a fire. As the wood crackled in the fire, Link leaned back up against the wall of his makeshift shelter. Around him, his various weapons and pieces of equipment were arrayed. He had attempted to sharpen his Zora's sword, but found its edge still to be quite sharp. His bow, likewise, was in fine condition and needed no maintenance. He had replenished his arrows in Zora's domain, leaving him with a quiver full of ordinary arrows and several remaining shock arrows as well. His shield had suffered some damage when fighting the beast inside Ruta, but it still seemed sturdy enough, though the red Sheikah eye now had a deep gash across its iris. Absently, he picked up the Guardian's sword, attempting to thumb it active again. Like before, it released a few feeble sparks, but otherwise remained inert. Sighing, Link placed it down on the ground to join the other pieces of equipment. 
He leaned his head back against the cool rock. Something felt wrong. He was restless, and he didn't think it had anything to do with seeing the Guardian earlier. Instead, he thought that it had something to do with his travels with Princess Zelda. Something about the path he'd taken the latter part of the day. Continuing north into the forest, instead of taking the road that would have taken him down into the wetlands, continued to stick out in his mind. He felt certain that he had traveled this road with Princess Zelda, and that it had been an important trip. Closing his eyes, he tried to locate the source of what he felt. He felt... anxiety. Nervous energy. Fear. But why? He picked up the Sheikah slate, sorting through the photographs again, looking for anything that would clue him in on what had happened here to leave such feelings attached to this place in his mind. He came to the photograph of Princess Zelda in her white dress, sad, yet trying to smile. Behind her, he could see a goddess statue standing over the pool of water. Rock walls surrounded the pool, and a pair of waterfalls spilled down on either side of the statue. Link frowned and lowered the Sheikah slate to his lap. He often felt drawn to that image, especially on nights such as these, when he grew introspective. But what good did it do him tonight, or any other night? He still felt that anxious sense of unease. He wanted to do something, yet nothing came to him. Outside the small cleft in the rock, rain still fell, leaving the night nearly black outside the small circle of orange light given off by his fire. Eventually, he fell into a restless sleep, head lulling to the side, the Sheikah slate still held in his hands. Outside, the rain eventually ceased and the clouds broke, revealing a brilliant array of stars in the moonless sky. Distantly, past the fallen citadel, past the raging volcano and the great river, across the green hills and fields, a princess watched her sleeping knight the best she could from within the place that was both her home and her prison. The beast that she kept at bay raged at the destruction of his blight, a piece of itself that it sequestered away in the divine beast upon its reawakening. Both she and the beast were far more aware of their surroundings now, though she believed that it was still blind to the world outside of the castle. Though many things remained under its influence, her power kept it from the direct connection that it had when it first emerged. She did her best to keep it from sensing Link's presence, for she feared the rage that Ganon would feel at seeing its longtime foe would be enough to break her hold over it. To Ganon, it had long since won. The death of Link and apparent destruction of the Master Sword had all but guaranteed its victory, just as killing her would do the same. Zelda's power would not hold it forever, and Ganon was patient. It pushed constantly against her power, testing her limits, waiting for her eventual moment of weakness. But still, she would endure.